You're listening to a podcast from The Word. I have a brief a topical stack wadi. A Good. stage invader leapt up and grabbed J- Jacob Rees-Mogg's microphone uh, in the National Conservatism Conference in Westminster this week to make a political point about fascism before being bundled off by four security men. It was one of the following five people. Which one? Was it Gerard Langley of the Blue, Le- Blue Aeroplanes? Was it Mont Dirk Campbell of the late 60s Proggers Egg? Was it Alan Boff Wally of Chumbawamba? Stuart Rossiter of East of Eden? Or was it the bass guitarist of Fat Mattress, Jim Leverton? Oh. Which of those people jumped up and just dis- was disturbed the, the Conservative Conference this week? Isn't that amazing? That is, I'm, my breath has been taken away by that list there. I, I kind of saw this item. I didn't see who the... Uh, I didn't realise. I saw it too, and I didn't know who it was. It turns out it was Mont Dirk Campbell of Egg. Remember Egg with uh, Dave Stewart and Steve Hillage? Egg. 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 Progress, progressive rock group, um, I think, were on the Decca DRAM label. I think that's right. And I think they made a record called E equals MC squared. This is amazing. I think they did. This is what you get when you work in a record shop. Exactly. You, know, you are cursed with retention. And you can't memory. forget it. You can't undo it. Absolutely. Isn't that amazing? He's now mentioned a, a member of Extinction Rebellion. He's an activist. So uh, that's the guy. Very good. Not that he looked familiar at all, but I just happened to find out. Extraordinary. So you say you had a stack waddy. I have a stack waddy. The stack waddy is based around the fact, and we, well, I think we might have done a, a spin on this before, actually, but this is a new version. Damien Lewis has an album out, right? The actor. All right. Uh, called Mission Creep, which is coming out in July. And uh, so five albums by actors, four real, one made up by me. Oh, okay. All right. So yep. which of these Which of these didn't actually happen? Did Jennifer Love Hewitt put out a record called Bare Naked in 2002, including a version of me and Bobby McGee, reviews the album's overridingly twangy tonicity suggests it might behove Hewitt to bust out that country album she seems eager to make. Okay, that's one. Two, Stephen Siegel had a record. Did he have a record called Songs from the Crystal Cave in 2005? Stevie Stevie Wonder on harmonica. Did Macaulay Culkin and his band The Pizza Underground have an album called Live at Chop Suey in 2014? Parodying (laughs) songs by the Velvet Underground with pizza-themed titles like All Pizza Parties, Pizza Gal, and Take a Bite of the Wild Slice. Okay, did that happen? Joe Pesci, did he have an album called Vincent Lagardia Gambini Sings Just For You? You're nodding. (laughs) Which was sung entirely in the persona of his My Cousin Vinny character. Uh, Review, the album is a mound of failed songs and lame jokes. And lastly, did Simon Pegg have an album called Uncle Dysfunctional? in 2005, which he sang and played guitar with Johnny Buckland of Coldplay. It was produced by Youth. Sample track, Beers for Souvenirs. Review, okay, review. Imagine the klaxons at half speed with added EDM, sung by a weird amalgam of Jarvis Cocker and Johnny Cash, and then try and forget it as quickly as possible. Which of those did not happen? Can I first of all say that is just a perfect textbook example of uh, of the Stagwaddy game, which was which was instituted many years ago to record the fact that uh, you simply can't make up pop music, can you? <laughs> because, you know, your most ludicrous fantasies are entirely plausible. They are probably yep. happened. You know, they happened many years ago, and they've been forgotten. And so I occasionally, as you went through that list, I thought, oh, yes, yes, I remember that. And then I thought, no, I don't remember that at all. And, like, for instance, Joe Pesci, I know he he made records. He did. He did make records. Did he make that one? I'm he, not did, sure. he did, actually. He did. No, okay. He made real records. And okay. then in 1998, somebody convinced me he should do that. I think it was a disaster. But he sang in the, char- in the character of my cousin, Vinny. Vinny. Right. I'm going to take a wild stab. Um, I think you made up Jennifer Love Hewitt. Oh, right. No, I didn't know. That was real. Jennifer Love Hewitt, was, as was Stephen Siegel, as was Macaulay Culkin, which is ridiculous. This terrible record of kind of pizza puns. No, it was, it was Simon Pegg. Simon, Simon Pegg has Pegg. not made a record. Wow. God. 
Although well, he has turned up at Coldplay concerts and played the harmonica. There you are. But no, he has never made a record. Certainly, and not one called Uncle Dysfunctional. But he, like probably will, he probably will do now. The Word Podcast. Prime cuts of popular culture served fresh each week. So working up to the sad news, the death of uh, Martin Amos, um, which came as a bit of a shock. Um, and I was thinking, as well as the, the many you know, qualities of Simon uh, of Martin Amos as a writer, you, have, you and I have been used over the years by, by his writing, particularly oh, his, his criticism. His memoir. I thought his <laughs> yeah. memoir was fantastic. Experiences of fantastic. Experience with that incredible picture on the front of him aged about nine with a cigarette in his mouth. Oh, it's extraordinary. It's really, I, really interesting and funny. I gave my son that for his 21st birthday. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Um, and um, and some other things as well. Um, but I always liked his criticism. Uh, a very a favorite book of mine of, of Martha Damon's is called The Moronic In. No, is it, did he write The Moronic Inferno? I think he did. Or is that he, close? I think he did. It's a collection yeah. of essays about America. Yeah. Very good. Um, but I think it shouldn't be forgotten that alongside all the writing, you know, his image was massively important in, in the launching. Of Martin Amos in, in a way, immense. in a way that it simply isn't, simply is not with any other writer. No matter how famous they are, nobody cares what they look like. Really, you know, nobody cares what J.K. Rowling looks like. Nobody cares what Stephen King looks like. Whatever, Martin Amos, from the day he was first launched, and I think I first saw him on. Uh, a BBC books program called, was it called Read All About It? I think yeah. Melvin Bragg used to chair. The theme tune used to be paperback writer by the Beatles. And they used to have little panels talking about the latest paperbacks. And there he was being launched whenever it was, the early 70s. Because he was pretty much a contemporary of mine. And so you took an interest. And there was this guy who turned up with kind of a, Long hair for a writer. Yes. Usually wearing a velvet jacket. Velvet jacket. And very and, skinny, and very, very acerbic. And usually terrifying, a terrified uh, interviewers. Usually a cigarette, uh, a lit cigarette being yeah. wielded at all times. But, you know, all authors, fiction authors, they all have their pictures taken for the for the jackets of their books. And in their pictures, you can see that they all desperately wish to be taken for rock stars, and they never are, not ever. They all look like librarians. Absolutely every last one of them looks like a librarian, with the exception... With the exception of Martin Amos. Martin Amos, who looked like a rock star. He really he carried himself like a rock star. Well, there was a, I was just listening to the Radio 4 this morning and, then, and somebody, I think I mean, Salban Rushdie described his, uh, his uh, literary swagger. I thought that was a good word because actually swagger was a word that, 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 that encompassed virtually everything about it. Was it was that confidence and that kind of, kind of arrogance, actually. Yes. Fantastic. Entitlement, you know. Absolutely. But he was, he was kind of sexy, you know. Yeah, he was. And, uh, and he carried that all the way through. Absolutely fascinating. Uh, how exceptional he was. Of course, also talking of literary matters, this week, you and I, I sent you the Will Self um, kind of mad column about... Oh, about Adrian Ed- Charles. It's fantastic. It's- that is knob, basically, isn't it? It's just extraordinary. In case anybody's missed this, Will Self r- wrote a column about Adrian Charles... Um, who's, uh, you know, broadcaster, sports journalist and so forth, and um, also married to... Uh, well, they married, I think they are married, aren't they? Married the other half, Kat, certainly, of Kath Viner. The, the, who's the editor of The well, Guardian. And he has a column in The Guardian. I don't read this. I don't know. The, so I'm clearly not as bothered as many people are. Oh, people have got very exercised about it. I think it's one of the most, the lamest columns and, and thus, could, could he only be writing it because he's attached to, to the editor? No, but there was a famous one about the fact he had a urinal installed in his house, didn't he? Which people just couldn't couldn't get their heads around. Oh, really? I oh, didn't yeah. say that. Didn't say that. But anyway, Will Self has written a, a column about 
how, how you know, this all gets up his nose. He's written it in the New European, which is kind of a pretty odd place to be writing that kind of that kind of column. It's not very European at all, is it? No, it's, it's, not. it's the definition of a kind of, you know, Groucho Club spat. It's, 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 I can't be any more parochial than Adrian Childs. Does that mean do anything to anybody outside? Absolutely. Of, I don't know. Outside of Kensington, probably not. But I tried to read it and, uh, you know, I, I failed to read it really. I sent it on to you or linked to it. Or I, I won't pretend to read it. And I realized why. Do you know how long it is? It's 2,300 words. Now, That's I've written that I've written columns. Two thousand three hundred. No columns be more than 700. Well, yeah, 1,000 at the very yeah. most. 2,300 is ridiculous. You can't sustain a column thought over 2,300 words. It simply can't be done. And it's just, I've attempted to read it. It's so tiring to read it, you know. And so what he appears to have achieved, have achieved is, a, is a massive double that he's um, he's kind of effectively cancelled his own career with self. But at the same time, somehow um, elevating the career of Adrian oh, Childs. Adrian Childs, that's right. Because people think, oh, well, whatever he, Adrian Childs has done, it can't really deserve that kind of thing. You know, this kind of 2,300 words of, uh, of, of absolute... Do you think it's done him that much harm? Who? Will Self. Will Self. I don't think Will Self's stock is terribly high in the literary world in, in the last few years. I don't think it has been. Um, I, I, I'm I, think, I think because a lot of people just <laughs> think of him as being wildly pretentious. I interviewed him once, actually, for Word, and he was really good, good value. And I wrote down, I think, about 23 words that he'd managed to squeeze into this conversation, which I just never, ever, ever used in any kind of colloquial speech, some of which I think he may have invented, actually. Yeah, like I'm Robbie sure. Coltrane in Black Adder, yeah. But uh, interfrastically, but no, I, I thought he was an extraordinary guy. But he's just he doesn't doesn't make friends, does he? He doesn't appear to. I was talking to the guy who um, did. Um, was I talking to him? No, I was talking to a guy, a guy in the audio books business the other day, and we were talking about you know how long it took to to, to record audio books. And how, you know, certain people are just very good at it and do it without fluffs and so forth. Will Self apparently records an audio book without taking any breaks. Doesn't take doesn't take quarter of an hour off for a cup of tea. Doesn't take a lunch break or anything. Just plows on absolutely through. That's but, remarkable. No, but I mean, obviously doesn't do it in one day, does he? I mean, he can't. He, well, I don't know. He would probably but he do never it. takes a break. You probably do it in a day and a half if you're not taking breaks. I would imagine, you know, because you know I've done it a few times. It's exhausting. It's exhausting. It's exhausting. It's exhausting. Even yeah. though it's your own prose and yeah. you know the rhythm of it and you wrote it yourself and it's familiar, but it's still really t- the amount of concentration. And also, you yeah. feel bad whenever you slip up and someone's got to kind of carve that out and patch it all together again. Yeah. Hard work. Well, and apparently he plows through. Anyway, um, uh, more literary news as we have it. This is a junction in the Word podcast. It separates that bit from this next bit. So, Paul Simon has got an intriguing record out. Have you heard it? I have. I was listening to it yesterday. Seven Psalms. And uh, it's... um, well, it's album length, isn't it? But it's, it's thirty-three minutes. It's effectively one track, isn't it? They all it all just runs together. Thirty-three minutes. I thought it was really good. Actually, it's fantastic. It's uh, yeah, entirely it's, acoustic, isn't it? It's just guitars. It's harmonium. Uh, a little choral uh, gang coming at one point. Um, it's beautiful, and it, it, it's it's about a lot of it's about the the notion of mortality, isn't it? Do you, can I interrupt you a second there? Do you think? And I know what you mean. All the reviews have said this is this is a man's last record kind of thing. This is, this is his last will and testament, musically speaking. No reason to believe that Paul Simon might not go on as long as Willie Nelson or whoever. Yeah. Willie Nelson, who celebrated his 90th birthday a couple of weeks ago, still in fighting uh, good fettle. Uh, Paul Simon, a mere, a mere 81, is, it? is that what he's he is? He's 82, I think. Oh, 82, yeah. okay. Um, so it tends to be taken as his last will and testament. Is that just something that we read into these things? Or would you, you know, if, if he had put that record out 
in you know, his forties, would you have would you have thought about it differently? I don't know really. I I think it's something to read into. I mean, the thing is, it's the it's the coincidence the fact that you know two years ago he sold his catalogue, didn't he, um, for a huge amount of money, kind of this, and thus has got rid of his his songs. He's done the farewell tour, hasn't he? So this is the last time we're going to. So he's he's kind of got his house in order. So anything that he might say. But then again, if you're 82, it, it's likely that you are thinking about the notion of mortality uh, reasonably frequently in terms of your own life and that of all your pals. So I don't know. But there's a track called The Sacred Harp, isn't there? There's one called Your yeah. Forgiveness. There's one called The Lord. The Lord is the ocean rising. The Lord is a terrible swift sword. So, you know, you can piece it all together and think that this is him sort of, yeah, as you say, <laughs> signing off to some extent. But, well, uh, yeah, it's interesting that there is a, a small group of these records and, and they're probably going to grow over yeah. time. So Leonard Cohen's last record was, he, he kind of, he felt he was getting to the end, didn't he, there? He yeah. He put, put out a record called You Want It Darker. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which could certainly be interpreted in that way. And obviously David Bowie, Black Star. Black Star, which was, I, I don't think he knew that he was terminally ill till he finished recording. He was actually making the Lazarus video All right. when he got the final diagnosis. But obviously he was aware that he was ill yeah. um, and therefore it was very preoccupying. And when the record came out, everyone thought that it was his, you know, that he he had been aware throughout the entire thing that, uh, that these were his, his days were numbered. But the one, the really significant one I remember was Warren Zevon. Remember The Wind? Oh, I guess. Yeah, Warren Zevon. I mean, he was given his, his terminal diagnosis and immediately rang up all his pals, booked the studio, went yes. in and recorded. Yeah, and they, all the turned up, yeah. they all turned up. the funny phrase. They all turned Oh, God, yeah, Bruce Springsteen, yes. Jackson yeah. Brown, I think Billy, Billy Bob Thornton's on it, and Jim Calder. And hence the, the great phrase, enjoy every sandwich, which was Absolutely. his uh, which was his brilliant advice. He, also, know, that's really he, also, put out, he also put out a record round about the same time. I don't know if it came round about the same time, which had a wonderful title for a for a kind of last record, which it was called My Rides Here. That's right, that's right. What a wonderful title. It's good, isn't it? <laughs> My rides here. Yeah. Um, the other one was Johnny Cash because Johnny Cash was misdiagnosed, yeah. wasn't he? Oh, God, yeah. I think in 1997 that they, he was told he had Parkinson's and then soon afterwards he was changed to a, a kind of form of multiple system atrophy. And he was told he had 18 months to live. And I'm fairly sure that it was during that time that he made records like um, Solitary Man. Do you remember that record? Yeah. Um, you know, and is that's all about it. I won't break down the Tom Petty song, Fields of Diamonds, the old folk song. I see a darkness. Um, but it, but the it's mercy all... seat the Nick Cave. So, and the general feeling was that he thought that his days were numbered. And then, and then after <laughs> quite a long period of time, he was, he was re-diagnosed. He said, oh, sorry, we got it all wrong. <laughs> But a bit like Wilco Johnson, actually. So it's another one. Just well, like, it oh. is. Because Wilco it Johnson, you know, was told he had a short time, then did his farewell talk, and then was told, he, you know, that he had an extension. And they got it wrong. My favourite, uh, I often reflect on this when thinking about this whole syndrome, which, as I say, is will only get, you know, larger, uh, you know, because all these people will continue making yeah. records until, until, they're, until they're gathered as well. <laughs> I would tell you that, good. that expression. I was I was talking to a splendid old Shakespearean actor uh, a couple of years ago, and I was recalling an old production that I'd seen him in when I was a teenager. I talk about the one of the other actors is in it. He goes, "Ah, gathered, <laughs> gathered." That's fantastic. <laughs> Gathered long ago. Anyway, that's really that's a great expression. It's also the idea that you're all in a big gang once you get there. You know what <laughs> yeah, I mean? All the old thesps are together. I suppose so. Sorry, a dry sherry before lunch. So the one, my one final reflection on this whole thing is: Bob Dylan recorded "Not Dark Yet," which has got that line. It's not dark yet, but it's getting there. Yeah. And when I first heard that, I thought. There's a man who hears the beating of the wings. <laughs> you know, there's the man who feels he had not not got long. 
It's 25 years ago. I know. <laughs> I know. Hold you know. Yeah, you, know, you can spin that period out. You can, It's quite interesting because Johnny Cash is a classic case of this. The key, I have to think the key shaping, thing that shaped our perception, the world's perception of Johnny Cash, is Andy Earle's photograph on the cover of the first American Recordings album. Where, whereas Johnny Cash is black and white picture, we all know this picture, shot from below, he's wearing this kind of Robert Mitchum type flared duster coat, you know, and he's got two dogs at his feet and he looks like an avenging preacher or something. And so Johnny Cash, for the, for the subsequent however many years he was left, which was quite a few years, was always photographed this way. He was yeah. always shown this way. He's like a figure out of an old 1940s movie. You know what I mean? He's an old man. Whereas if you looked at Johnny Cash earlier, there he was, you know, in his kind of uh, in his spangly suit posing with the Muppets and absolutely yeah. anybody. You know I mean? He was showbiz Johnny Cash. But no, for the last bit of his life, he's reborn as gothic Johnny Cash. And uh, Bob Dylan kind of done, has done the same thing, really. Completely done the same thing. Because Bob Dylan, you look at him now and he looks possibly older than he actually is. And it's all about wisdom, isn't it? Yes. He's the sage, the prophet, the seer. Yeah. You know, he's learnt everything that can be learnt in life. You're absolutely right. So uh, we can't let the word goth, uh, gothic go by without mentioning that we've been talking to Kathy Unsworth about a really book. Good. A book, uh, what's it called? The Book of Goth. The Book of um, Goth called Season of the Witch. The Season book of, of the goth. Witch, The Book of Goth. Uh, and and the whole history of the of the kind of dark tendency. Really? I thought it was really interesting. She talks about goth fathers and goth mothers, Edgar Allan Poe, Jim Morrison, Audrey, Aubrey Beardsley, you know. Also, very interesting conversation about who first used the word goth. She thought it might have been Mary Harron in a 1979 Melody Maker review of Joy Division, didn't she? So well, it was quite been. interesting, actually. Who invented yeah. that term? Yeah, yeah. And the other great thing about goths is that, is that goths, when they become goths, they, 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 they never quite give up on it. You know, you can be all sorts of things in life. You can be a terrible old hippie and then completely reinvent yourself. But if once a goth, there's always a gothic streak in you, I think. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, she was very good about just living a, a teenage life in rural Norfolk, wasn't she? In a, in a little bedroom. And of, of course, posters. and of course, she confirmed my theory that in popular music, it all comes down to one thing and one thing only: hair, hair, goth hair. The word podcast: two cocoa tins and a piece of string. Talking of hair, further because you never talk about hair too much. Um, did you see the Nick Broomfield Brian Jones film? I did. I did. I thought it was really good, actually. It's fantastic. And God, so much of that is about hair, isn't it? His well, Brian hair was Jones. immaculate. It's absolutely. absolutely. And the other interesting thing was that he has a series of relationships. I think I'm right in saying that having fallen out with his parents and basically been booted out by his dad, very moving to read out his dad's letter to him at the end, mm. apologising for that, very moving actually. But having been booted out, he started a, a pattern of existence, which was basically moving into the family homes of the girls he was going out with, who then got pregnant, and then he was booted out. And I think he did this five times. I'm pretty sure. And the other interesting thing was that one of them talks about him very witheringly, actually, and very soberly, and says he was a very, very, very bitter and lonely and difficult, uh, complicated guy. And, uh, you know, very wound up about a lot of things. She said, I thought it was very interesting that he always finished up with girls who looked exactly like him, or if they didn't, he, he kind of modelled them to look like him. And she said it was an irony, really, because he, he didn't like himself at all. And yet he wanted these people fashioned in his uh, in his likeness, you know. I thought it, it was a really interesting film. They also used to say the same about Mick Jagger, didn't they? Um, when Mick married Bianca. Bianca, who basically just looked exactly like Mick, didn't she? <laughs> Astonishing. Incredible, the perfect couple. Because Bianca, back in the news this week, since Jade has been getting into trouble, hasn't she? God, yeah, in a, in a, in a, in a restaurant like Ibiza. And I think her boyfriend's been arrested. She hasn't got four years, in, four months in jail. Has it really? I don't I know don't what know. happened. I there was an altercation, but my God, she looks like you wouldn't want to cross with her. No. So she's, but, but the other 50, she's thought, 51 years old, I note. 
She's 51. Yeah, I know. So Mick and Bianca's daughter is I 51 know. and still calling herself jewelry designer. Have you got any jewelry designed by Bianca? Because <laughs> I haven't seen much myself. Model anyway. and activist. I know, yeah. no, not yes, much. Model, accurate <laughs> activist. Yes. Um, yeah, so Brian Jones, it's all about the hair. But has anybody ever been overshadowed quite so quickly in popular music? as Brian Jones was. You know, it was his group. You know, he was the one that gave them the name. He was the kind of leader. But because and, and he also didn't Bill write Wyman, the songs... Bill Wyman is, and talks brilliantly, doesn't he, about how he was the architect of their sound. That kind yeah. of lean blues sound, that spare sound, and how all his flute and sitar and yeah. live guitar on Little Red Rooster, all that, that was an important part of the sound it was. But you felt so much sympathy for him. As you say, his group... And there's an interview where he's asked, uh, so you know, so what, what inspires you to write the songs? Yeah. And he sort of says, "Look, I, I, I don't, I don't write the songs." So embarrassing. You'll have to ask Keith and Mick. And the guy like, either doesn't hear him, or I don't know. And then says, "So, so go back, go back to these songs that you write." He, he says, says, "No, look, I, no, I, I actually, don't, I don't write the songs. You'll have to yeah. go and talk to them. Anything. This is terrible." Yeah, yeah. And they must have just decided to put the microphone in his face because he had the best hair. I think that's it. He had the kind of the you know the most um, the iconic Rolling Stones hair. If you were going to draw the Rolling Stones hair in 1965, it would have been Brian that you would have drawn. Yeah, because Keith's wasn't even that long, really. No, and Bill's was kind of odd. Charlie's wasn't that long. Mick's wasn't that long actually. Brian's was was always long, you know, and it was always just kind of silver king perfect, wasn't it? You know, because because people used to. You know, disapproving authority figures, you say, oh, you can't have long hair. It must be dirty. Well, you looked at Brian Jones' hair and you thought, no, it couldn't possibly be dirty. It looks it looks it absolutely perfect. There's another sweet letter we written to his parents, those letters to his parents, and he says yeah. so. He just wanted them to love him, and they, they found him so difficult, you know. And he wrote to his parents and said, I'm hoping to see you on Sunday. I must apologise because my hair is rather long. You think, uh-huh. oh, my God. And also, in fact, he was quite posh, which I don't think I realised, actually. Yeah, he I was think, speaking I, voice. I think it was, yeah, I think that is a reflection of the changing times since then, really. Because yeah. he wasn't, I don't think he was massively posh. But he, the thing that struck me watching the film, and I talked to, spoke to Nick Broomfield about it, is, you know, they kind of, they looked like a threat to society, but when you spoke to them, they were like Jennings and Derbyshire. You know, <laughs> do you remember Jennings and Derbyshire? Yeah, completely, yeah. The, you know, the, the, the prep school, you know, fiction that people used to read in the 50s and 60s, you know, that, that everybody growing up in those days, they knew, that they knew how they had to behave. You yeah. know, they might choose not to behave like that, but they knew how to behave. And so particularly when they wrote letters, the letter is very formal. Thank you very much for your yeah, for your very letter. Polite. It yeah. means a lot to us. All that kind of thing, you know. And I still think it's amazing when you read those early, you know, early letters from the Beatles to fans. You know, in the middle of Beatles, I know they managed to sit down, handwrite an individual letter, Just and somebody managed to organise getting it in the post. It's incredible, really. It's absolutely extraordinary. I thought it was interesting that they're so consumed, the Stones, by self-image that they're no good when you interview them together. Nobody says anything because they're terrified of saying the wrong thing. Well, I was talking doing. about... Uh, but you know the Beatles, you put a microphone in the middle of the Beatles, they just outdo each other. Too. It's you funny. The uh, the most flip. I was, ta- I was talking to uh, John Higgs about this when John Higgs and I did this thing at the Bath Literature Festival last week, we were talking about the Beatles. And um, I don't, you must remember when the Beatles did Jukebox Jury, when they were the panel on Jukebox yeah. Jury four of them, special, you know, desk for them to sit behind and so forth. And that was a success. And then not long afterwards, the Rolling Stones were the panel. Not a success at all. No, they were terrible. The, because the Rolling Stones could not be themselves. The Beatles had found a way to be themselves. Yeah. Even with the four of them. Because no, they the were Stones joint. cancelled each other out. They absolutely. And they were always trying to catch each other out, you know. Yeah. Whereas the Beatles turn themselves just into the opposite. Dark. They're encouraging her to be funnier and funnier. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, interesting. Uh, Pet Shop Boys film was fantastic. On telly last night. My wife and I were watching it last night. I thought it was amazing. Neil, there were two moments I thought were just brilliant. This is uh, this is Neil and Chris being interviewed by Dermot O'Leary, I think. You know, yeah, talking about that. their old TV. They're uh, showing clips. the thing that you wrote a wonderful cover story for Rolling uh, for Radio for Times, Rolling Stone. For Rolling Stone. Rolling and, Times. Uh, Rolling yeah. Times. And uh, they're sitting in a little movie theatre, and they specifically asked not to see any of the footage first, which yeah. is brilliant because they are really, really. At some some points, he says, "Do you know? I don't think I've ever seen this." You know? No, well, I think so well, the clip the, of Dusty Springfield, the clip, and the of, clip of us in the uh, in the Smash Hits office. Smash office. Know, Neil, had, Neil had never seen that. I don't think he'd ever seen it. No, he hadn't. Um, and I get mixed up. This is Smash Hits office. It must be eighty three, eighty four, or something like that. Yeah. And there, we had two film crews come in round about that period, one BBC, one ITV, both for yeah. Saturday morning kids' TV, I think. And I get mixed up which one's which. Uh, one of the features, Martin Fry, but that, that was not that one, I don't think. Uh, and it's just amazing to see you and me and Neil and Steve Bush and David Bostock, Birchie and all kinds of people. I, you know, these things that were done for... Uh, just for a laugh for, for a Saturday morning children's TV all those years ago, end up being these documents. Historic you documents. Look, you look at I them. I know. Like, that's just You're looking at this thing, not only has it got Neil Tennant, it's also got how magazines were made. Yes. You actually took a photograph <laughs> on a slide, put it in a projector, yep. projected it onto a sheet of paper, and then traced the outline of Paul Weller's head or whatever it was onto a layout. You know, and you 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 had rollers full of wax that you you put the layouts on. And it was extraordinary. It's all but that Neil was sorry. Go on. It's all that workaday stuff that is always the most memorable. You know, I'm always I always look, love looking at old photographs where they just show you, I don't know, Oxford Oxford Street on the third of January, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you just think, oh, well, look at what are they? Look at those people. Look at the cars. Look at whether they got yellow lines or not, all that kind yeah. of stuff. And um, I tell you what, I was, when I was writing my book about um, the LP, the culture of the LP, a fabulous creation, one of the things we, we had difficulty with was finding photographs of record shops from the days when record shops were ten a penny. Yeah. And record shops were on every corner. Nobody took photographs of them. Now that they're they hardly here at all. You know, they're, they're a pilgrimage. Absolutely. They're a shrine. And, and so, you know, that film shows how, as you say, how a magazine was put together in those days. Wouldn't you love to see a film that showed you how, I don't know, Virgin Records in Leeds worked in 1975 or something like that? Yeah. I would love to see that kind of thing. Of course, fantastic. nobody filmed anything like no. that because it was just so standard they didn't bother at all, you know. I thought it was interesting looking at Neil. That I, I felt that, that that Neil hadn't changed at all since the time that we knew him. No, uh, I, really extraordinary. He's still exactly the same. He's so modest about their success. But two lovely moments. One th thing is he has a kind of journalistic eye for detail. He remembers everything. He talks about meeting David Bowie, and he says David Bowie was eating a ham baguette. He said, "I thought I thought he'd probably be eating kind of Argentinian sardines or something, but no, a ham baguette." And rather enjoying it, I think. And then he talks about when they're offered the chance to play Live 8 in Red Square in Moscow, and he's showing the clip of it. And he says, look, we don't really approve of these things. We think that these charity shows are really don't really help the charities. They really just help the careers of the people taking part. So we're going to turn it down. And he tells Chris he's turned down. Chris goes, you've turned down Live 8. Get back on the phone. And he rings back and he says, so, actually, I've... I, I, I understand that we are doing it after all. Because it's just a lovely idea that you've been told that they are doing it. You know? It's like a married couple, isn't it? You know, I know. You know, yeah, if you don't check it with a husband or wife or whatever. I know, you you're know. in trouble. No, always, it's, a, it's really worth work. seeing this BBC programme. It'll be on iPlayer. It's fantastic. So, so I, you know, Neil was, uh, told me after it appeared that, because uh, I asked him about, I asked them, them about artificial intelligence. And uh, and Neil said, "Well, you know, it's a tool, and you know, it's not impossible. You might, <laughs> you might use it on a song that you had kicking around that you'd never managed to finish, or you'd never managed to put a bridge on, or whatever. And you might get it to suggest something, and then change it, but it would move you forward. 
And he said, he said, subsequent to that appearing in the piece, they were asked to address a conference about artificial intelligence. No. <laughs> so, and I was like, just so desperate to get get a big name in there. And they had to say, yeah, yes. Or, <laughs> or actually know. to get anyone sending positive about it. Because what he was saying was quite positive. And I thought it was a really good point. Yeah. Because if you yeah. get stuck sometimes when you're writing, you tend to Google things idly to see if it'll just send you off in a direction. And of course, you know, if AI can suggest uh, uh, how to fill a hole in one of your songs, as you say, you've always got the option that you won't use it, but one day you, you possibly will use what it suggests, in which case you've then bought into it, you know. So uh, I thought that was a really interesting, because most it's people a, say it's absolutely a, not. You know? It's a helper, isn't it? It and is. It, it's quite interesting because, you know, we've both written for a living for a long time, and if you certainly, particularly the case if you're doing it regularly for a certain title, you you grow used to the fact that the overwhelming majority of paid work in in writing uh, is drudgery. It's doing the same yeah, stuff is. again and again. It's just finding a slightly different way to say, "Here's the singles reviews," or "Here's here's the match report." You know what I mean? It's the same stuff again and again, done slightly differently. And so, you know, it can make your brain hurt trying to think of a different way to yes. do it, you know, when you've done it a hundred times or whatever. And so you can see these tools coming along as a way to um, a way to take some of the drudgery away from it. You know? um, but then they're, they're never going to, they're not going to replace the kind of special work that goes into doing something that sounds or reads There's different. There's another thing that Neil said about the most exciting time of his life. I think it was before they'd even made records, that they were living in London, him and Chris, and they were writing songs and trying to record. And all the things that happened to him subsequently, none of them seemed quite as incredible as that. And you think of the astonishing things they've achieved. There was an interview with Sting the other day. Sting's gone on this uh, Ivan and Bellows thing. And Sting made a really interesting point. He was talking about, he, he said he was up a, a, a ladder painting the ceiling of his flat in 1977. And he had Radio 1 on, and Roxanne came on the radio. He said he pretty much fell off the ladder, he said. He said, uh, after that, he said, it's just diminishing returns. No, I'm sure it's just I thought that was a really interesting thing. And I, I, I felt the same way that, that life is, is so like that. I can remember that my first thing that I ever wrote appearing in December 1977 in, um, in the Record Mirror. It was a review of Elvis Costello and the Attractions. They spelt my name wrong, actually. Mark Ellen, E-L-L-A-N. And I can remember reading that and rereading it and just being absolutely intoxicated and going out and just sort of, did I swing around lampposts clicking my heels? I probably did. I don't know. I remember being so, so thrilled. And uh, so that's a pattern of life, isn't it? I've got a, I've got a quote here from uh, uh, Charles Dickens. Oh, yeah. One of my favourites. When... He first got something printed in a magazine and he remembered how he'd delivered the copy um, one night, posted it in a letterbox in a dark office up a dark court in Fleet Street. I think about this every time I ever get, find myself down Fleet Street. If you're down there and you go across the road for some brides, you can cut through into what it, I think is called Johnson Court, where Samuel Johnson's yeah. house was. You know the place I mean? Yeah, yeah. And there you go, little, you go in between uh, a pub and an office or whatever. And I always think of Dickens going up there and posting his, you know, his first piece into the office uh, at twilight with fear and trembling into a dark letterbox in a dark office up a dark court in Fleet Street. And then he says, it appeared in all the glory of print on which memorable occasion, how well I recollect it, I walked down to Westminster Hall because he was working in Parliament at the time as a parliamentary reporter and turned into it for half an hour because my eyes were so dimmed with joy and pride that they could not bear the street and I wasn't fit to be seen by anybody. Fantastic. As Charles Dickens. And also, do you know what's interesting about that? His name wasn't on it because That's his right. name wasn't on anything he wrote early on. You know what I mean? And so when it was, just, it was a pseudonym anyway. So yeah, yes. yeah. That's uh, right. But this, that was just pride in seeing his work, you know, in print. 
at the age of whatever he was, 20 or something. Well, I'd like um, to think my eyes were, were similarly dimmed with joy and pride. Right? So it's dimmed with joy and pride. Dimmed with joy and pride is a really good way of describing it. Is. it. It's beautiful. But no, they, that, business yes, about, tears. that business about being played on the radio is so true. And, and really, the BBC, you know, if they want to promote Radio 1 and Radio 2, It'd be a really natural thing to do. Just go and get all the famous people in the world to tell you about when they were first played on Radio 1 or Radio 2 because they'll all remember it. Absolutely yeah. every one of them will remember it because they, they can do, you know, if you talk to them. They, they never, and, and particularly if they hear it, if they're a band, if they hear it together or one of them hears it and then rings up the other one and say, quick, turn on, you know, oh, yeah. whatever it is. We're being played. And then they just catch the end of it, or whatever, you know. That is, uh, that is in, the, in the days well, before Billy you Bragg, can replay anything, you know. You could get Billy Bragg to tell that lovely story about him being out in Hyde Park with a load of mates playing football one summer's evening and they had John Peel on, didn't they, on the radio. And, uh, and he hears John Peel saying that he... he, he Killed for a mushroom biryani, or it was, and he raced out, got a mushroom bir- biryani, took it to um, to broadcasting house, and they rang up from reception. So there's a guy here with a mushroom biryani, and he's also bought a record. And I think that's when he delivered his EP that he'd made. Oh, really? And that uh, Peel then played that I think twice and thanked him very much. And those kind of immortal moments. I mean, Billy Bragg still talks about that with tears in his eyes. You know, mm. completely changed his career. Really amazing. Yeah. So Graham Nash uh, mentioned in an interview this week uh, with Sar Franz Mansour, I think, um, he said, I don't think we'll be remembered. There's another person thinking about his epitaph. Yeah. I don't think we'll be remembered. Janie Mitchell and Jimi Hendrix will be remembered, but we won't. Well, I thought it's interesting because... I don't think Hendrix will, actually. Well, it's interesting, that is, <laughs> because, you know, you, you and I are old enough. I, it's the most frequently uh, used, you know, expression in this podcast. Too. You and I are old enough. Yeah, yeah. people of see, our age to see how people's stock waxes and wanes, you know, post death. You know, so Jimi Hendrix's stock used to be a lot higher than it I is think now. It's on the it strikes slide. me. Yeah. Strikes me. I don't know why that is. You know, it could be. There's, there were just so many Jimi Hendrix reissues years ago. There was a kind of glut on the market, and there's there's very little curiosity to hear anything new because there's just tons of it's been out there. And uh, I've got a theory about Hendrix. Well, I think it's about seeing Hendrix play. If you see a film of Hendrix playing, it's fantastic. If you take that film away and you don't see the whole technical performance mm. then you're just left with the song and the sound on the radio which you very very rarely hear i think it's like the same with u2 actually i quite like quite like u2's records but but i don't rush off and listen to them and you never really hear much of them on the radio but i have seen u2 uh, play a couple of times and it's fantastic when you right. see them play it's a spectacle and i think i think and i think that might be the same with led zeppelin i don't know led zeppelin again it's a it's just a particular sound and what makes you last is the quality of those songs, I think, um, and whether or not they have enough of them. I think Leonard Cohen will last. I think Joni Mitchell will last. People who write songs that that you could apply to your own life. Paul Simon, a really good example. Pet Shop Boys again, actually. But people, there are certain acts who you can't separate from the concept of the act themselves. But I think Oasis is a really good example. You can't hear an Oasis record without thinking of the idea of Oasis. Yeah. And I wonder if those things will last as long as some other things. I don't know. I'm not yeah. sure. But Joni Mitchell, you know, like we say, Jimi Hendrix's stock not quite as high, it seems to me, as it was when, 30 years ago maybe? Yeah. Uh, Joni Mitchell's stock, on the other hand, higher than it was. Much higher. Too. It's incredible. So, although she was always, you know, the, the, she was always popular and um, and much acclaimed. But uh, and Nick Drake's stock higher. Than Beach Boy is possibly higher. I don't know. ELO, Steely Dan. There are various people you feel are still really rumbling. Kate Bush too. There was a long piece this week. Uh, I read somewhere about how Steely Dan's time is now. <laughs> really, you know, really. Wow. They, 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 they kind of sound. 
they sound um you know if if you believe that that Steely Dan are the geniuses of cynicism yeah um, now's the time for them really you know what I mean because they they sound as if they uh, foretold absolutely everything, everything that has happened subsequently. But it's interesting this whole business about posthumous reputation. I was, um, we've just this year, isn't it? Is it the uh, whatever anniversary, four hundredth anniversary of the publication of Shakespeare's first folio? Yeah, which is the first proper compilation of his compilation collection yeah of, of his of his nearly complete works put together by is it hemming and Connell, the the um managers or whatever he didn't want it to be forgotten because he'd been dead at that point eight years or something and they put this thing together and that's where his reputation starts you know because during his lifetime he's just one of many dramatists whatever so that's like a greatest hits album it's out. a greatest hits yeah. album that comes out you know quite a few years afterwards and for the first time, people have the unusual experience offered to them of being able to sit down and read a play, whereas it, you'd never thought of reading a play before. You saw it performed, you know, but, but you could read it. And this was so successful that they did a, a further edition a few years later. And this time, it had an introduction by Ben Johnson, writing about my old mate Shakespeare and how, how remarkable it was. So it's at that point that you get Shakespeare taken out of the the mass of Jacobean Elizabethan uh, dramatists and and being promoted as the great genius of English English letters, which he's been ever since. And you know what's interesting parallel to this is Robert Johnson's King of the Delta Blues. Thing. Yes, it is. Just it the is. same thing happens. Yeah. So, so he Robert Johnson dies, what, 37? Something like that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, in 1938... John Hammond, you know, the, the great impresario, A&R man, journalist, whatever, is putting together these concerts, Carnegie Hall, called From Spirituals to Swing, which is the idea of celebrating, I suppose, the African-American tradition of music in the United States. And he's got everybody there. He's got Benny Goodman there, I know, all sorts of people. And he wants Robert Johnson because he's heard Robert Johnson records. And so he tries to get Robert Johnson, then finds out he's dead. And I think during the concerts, they actually wheeled a gramophone onto the stage and played a Robert Johnson 78 for the audience so they could hear what they, you know, the nearest thing to what they would have heard had Robert Johnson come to New York, had he been still alive or whatever. And when King of the Delta, Delta Blues singers so came they, out, there was this, no picture of him. No, but this is the thing. So no, nothing happened then, really. Apart from the Second World War, okay, fifties, nineteen sixty-one, at John Hammond's instigation, Columbia put together the King of the Delta Blues singers. There's no photograph; they have no idea what he looks like. So they they have a line uh, drawing on the front. They have the line drawing of you know showing him from above as if he's in a kind of prison yard or something like that, playing a, you know playing playing the guitar. Hammond gives that record to Bob Dylan, and Bob Dylan becomes obsessed with Robert Johnson to the extent that when Bringing It All Back Home comes out in 1964, is that right? Yeah. Have we got it right? One of the artifacts so. on the cover alongside Bob Dylan is a copy of T and the Dales Blues Singers by Robert Johnson. So, And so the thing, the thing they'd done is they'd said, okay, Rob Johnson is not just a Delta Blues singer. He's the king of the Delta Blues singers. You know, so it's like it's like Ben Johnson with Shakespeare. Yeah. You know what I mean? Just take this person out of the mass. And uh, and that's been it. that's been his reputation ever since, you know, and will will continue. It's an extraordinary thing. So that's how kind of posthumous re uh, reputations, you know, happen. So who knows whether Crosby Stills Nash. I know right? that's the thing you well, want to know. Don't. Fifty years time, Crosby Stills Nash. I kind of feel is also music that's that's tied to a particular time that can date, you know, and the, their association is still late sixties, I think, and early seventies. But there I'm are lots sure. of big authors, you know, that that nobody reads anymore. It strikes me 
the, the 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 one of the biggest authors of the Victorian period was Walter Scott. So Walter yeah. Scott, I even know nobody reads Walter no, Scott no. anymore. Stuart Summer McCartney Summer. was on Radio Four the other day talking about J.B. Priestley. Say J.B. Priestley, everyone yeah. used to read him. Yeah, absolutely. Out now. The, the yeah. winner of that particular race is Orwell, kind of contemporary. Yeah. And Orwell's yeah. the one that everyone still talks about and still reads. You know, yeah. so you can just come in and out of fashion. You know, definitely. You're listening to the Word Podcast, where the time is. Whenever you want it to be. So Andy Rourke of the Smiths, and it's lovely to see all the tributes to him, quite rightly, because I went back and listened to some of those records. Um, this Charming Man, Big Mouth Strikes Again, uh, Barbarism Begins at Home, Frankly Mr. Check. And the, the bass parts on those are absolutely extraordinary. A lot of it's to do with the fact that it's a trio. And if there's only one guitar, there's all that extra room to explore as a bass player. But Andy Rourke's style was this really lean, sharp, wiry, kind of driven funk sound, which was a combination of those beautiful um, kind of high melodic runs and big, fat bass root notes. And actually, it was just as integral to the Smith sound as anything else. It, I think he's absolutely fantastic. You know, you think all those groups where if you took out, they took out the whole of the Oasis rhythm section, all three of them, and nobody really noticed, you know. But but in the Smiths, it was a particular sound, and uh, he was really a big part, a big main architect of it, I think. And uh, wonderful chap. Lovely to see him so uh, so widely acclaimed. This podcast was brought to you by the Word. And- 